Alexander, of course, the reason I'm chatting to you today is about uh, the announcement that you will be doing an It's My Shout short film. How did you yeah. get involved with that? Well, me and It's My Shout go way, way, way back. I acted in a film called Pig Feet, when it was my second year in drama school, so that was 2008, directed by Kai Howells. A sort of The Hills Have Eyes set in Kefili. It was really weird. I was playing a sort of like toothless hick. Um, very strange, with really thick, broad Welsh accents. Um, so yeah, I acted in 2008. The following year, wrote my first one, which is a, um, a film called Junior, which is about a little kid who his mum beats him and he escapes into an imaginary world of a professional wrestler. Um, because I've got a big affinity with wrestling, so I was like, I'll just write what I know. Um, so, yeah, me and it's my show go way, 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 way back. And, um, and yeah, this one, I've had, I've been directing now. You can see the, that's Lola, my first short film. That's won loads of awards recently. And then here we are, it's just finished, um, it's finished as post-production. So um, I sent a script to Roger, and it's my shout, and went through the proper channels of the whole thing, and... And it got selected, and it's great, and I get to direct it, which is even better. So it's and, and it's the first time I'm directing my own work or my own writing. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, we're currently, uh, you know, in a period of lockdown. Uh, yeah, my shout's still uh, very, very proactive in kind of uh, promoting films that it's about to release. Uh, what can you tell us about your film? <laughs> what can I tell you about mine? Um, I have a great affinity with the mods in the 1960s. The first album I ever remember listening to from start to finish, really, really young, not really, I mean, appreciating it, but not really understanding the sort of genius of it was Quadrophenia by The Who. Mm -hmm. um, that's down to my stepfather. My stepfather was a big music advocate. Um, my, my dad was a big suede ed, not a mod. Ah, okay. I've even got a, ta a, a mod tattoo. Lovely. So, this is how much the mod sort of means to me. I, the style, the, the music, I the best style. So, um, so yeah, I wrote, I wrote this story about a little, about a, uh, a guy, a little boy called Billy, who's a mod, who goes to Brighton in 1964 for the, for the famous uh, mods versus rockers fight on Bank Holiday Monday. And that's sort of the framework, if that, is actually about a boy wanting his father to be proud of him. So it's set in Wales, and it's also set in Brighton. Um, very ambitious of it's my shout to let me try and do this. Obviously, we won't be filming in Brighton. I mean, I, if, the budget, if the budget can allow it, but um, probably be poor call, if I'm honest. Yeah. But, um, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a big sort of fight, but in, but in, the, in the cutaways, it's, um, it's about a young boy just wanting his dad to say that he's proud of him, you know? And his dad's from the military, fought in Second World War, sort of quite a tough skinned, that generation where they never even said that they love you, you know? Mm -hmm. Really hard work. And, and he's seeing his son just be a mod and be on a Vespa, he doesn't appreciate it. So it's, yeah, it's, it, there's two things going on at the same time, this sort of fight and a, and a father-son relationship. So yeah, that's, that's, that's it, that's how I want. And, and for you, kind of, what was it, apart from, you know, your family connection with it, what was it about that particular era that you were really invested in that you absolutely adored? Do you know when people ask you that question about, um, if you could pick any era, where would you, you know, mine's always been the 60s. I just, just the height of the 60s, like just, you know, 64, 65, music, the Beatles, the Who, like the kinks, it's just, and the swing 60s kicks in 66, like it's amazing. Mm. Um, the clothes, the fashion, the whole thing. It's, it's, um, yeah, I adore it. I just, and also like looking at the, the naughty, like the nineties into the noughties into down the teens and the twenties, like there's no fashion. There's no, you know, m real sort of solid sort of music that defines an era. It's, 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 it's more varied granted, you know, but, um, but yeah, the sixties, I just, I was just very lucky when I was very young to have a stepfather that played me the Ramones and the Clash and the Pistols and, and the Who. And from like the ages of three, I was listening to Ramones in the car. Like it's just like, and to have that, and Bruce, and my first ever concert that I ever saw live was Bruce Springsteen, you know, like, wow. like the, the scale of what I was given as to, in terms of like generational music is, that really touched me. And I think I am one is me sort of giving back to my stepfather really in a weird way, sort of like saying thank you.
So I suppose it's a personal project in that respect. So for me, you know, I, I was brought up on the music, much like yourself, I was brought up on the music of like David Bowie and, um, yeah, yeah. And, and music icons like that. So they kind of inspired you to do this. If you have this, what they always say, Sam, is that, that you should always write what you know. Mm. You know, like, don't try and write, I wouldn't, you know, I couldn't, just don't try and write out of your reach. And the reason why I think I, Iron One got selected was because it, it's, it's deeply personal, you know, it's, it's um, and also it, it'll resonate with quite a lot of people. I think a lot of people, whether it's a generational thing, but, you know, I mean, I still have, str- I still have trouble trying to get my dad to tell me that he's proud of me, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, he comes and sees me at the National Theatre and on the Olivier and I'm like, Tell me, <laughs> you know. So there's, there's the, even that's a sort of um, the true thing. But yeah, no, write what you know, and and then the, the film will sing. I think it'll, it'll really, um, yeah, it'll really resonate with those people. I think. I was going to ask you about that actually, because you know you're usually renowned for being an actor in front of the camera. What was it like to yeah. kind of uh, take a step back and go behind the camera and actually swap roles? Well, um, I've been acting since I was fourteen. You know, I was in Pablo Cum as a fourteen-year-old boy. Um, it's it's been a long time in the industry. I'm, tw- I'm 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 coming up to my 32nd birthday, so I've been acting for quite a long time. I went to Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, got an amazing agent, and I haven't really stopped working. What happens through that time is that you sort of lose uh, the love for it. If I'm honest, you lose the sort of um, the passion and the reason why you got into the industry. Um, certain roles pop up, and you think, "Oh, that's why." But the um, and I just sort of. For mental health reasons, really, I just sort of wanted to take a step away. I've been, in, I've been, I've got to work with some amazing directors in my TV career, in Merlin and in Versailles and all these things, and to be able to work with those directors and see how masterful of their craft that they were, mm-hmm. I was like, I want to do that, and I haven't, I haven't gone to film school, haven't, you know. Haven't, you know, picked up a book and tried, like, I don't know, directing for dummies. I've literally just watch people that are far more talented than I am. And I've just copied and copied and pasted, literally done that, you know? So I think, um, I just, acting, acting is always going to be there. To me. Mm-hmm. Always, um, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And there's a, and there's a huge following and a massive um, fan base for me, which is really, really touching. I just, um, I've just never been happier when I was directing Lola and here we are. Like I've never, never, ever been happier. So would you, say you prefer, would you say you prefer directing to acting then, I suppose? Well, it's tough, I'd imagine, because, you know, for yourself, growing up on the television, essentially, must, uh, yeah. you must kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it, I suppose. Yeah, I it's think. exactly that. It's a love-hate relationship. Um, I've just finished I'm doing a, um, a TV series called The Window, which is um, it's about football. And, um, it, and I'm playing a sort of horrible, like... Um, misogynistic, racist, um, like a Joey Barton type football player. Like he's he's angry, he does drugs, he's an awful guy. And those roles are brilliant to play, but they wear you down. Mm. They really wear you down physically and mentally. I come back after filming and I'm just like exhausted. Where with directing, it's what I was, it goes back to what I was saying about mental health, is that the, there's something about directing that you get emotionally and physically drained, but, it's, but you can still come home and be yourself. Yeah, you haven't, you haven't, in acting, for me as well, my biggest pitfall as an actor is always I invest so much. I really invest so much in a character. Um, but it, it takes a toll on you. And with directing, you invest in other people. Mm-hmm. You're not investing in yourself. You're, you're giving out. You're trying to get the makeup department and the, and the writing department and the camera to be at their best. And I think that's so much more rewarding to see other people thrive than you concentrate solely on yourself, you know? <laughs> It's weird, I suppose, in the respect that, you know, even something I've noticed actually working in television is that people automatically assume that you're like that all the time. So (laughs) for me, you know, on Cardiff TV or, you know, on the local TV channel, I'm constantly full of energy. I'm constantly going around interviewing people. And people people actually meet me. They're like, wow, you're you're quiet. And it's just like, it's mad, you know, the, the transition between being on the television you know, as opposed to being off the television, it is, is mad. Um, but back to It's My Shout. Yeah. Uh, it's My Shout offers opportunities for many different types of people trying to get into the creative industry. Um, why do you think It's My Shout succeeds so well? And why do you think people love it so much? 
it's grassroots, isn't it? It's mm. getting people into an industry where they don't, where they probably would never imagine that they could. Mm -hmm. It's literally giving them a step on the ladder, a rung on the ladder. Not even just giving them a step; it's giving them a helping hand onto it, and and giving them the contacts. And because that's what this industry is, really. You learn as you go. Everyone does. You don't just you don't just get born a sound designer. You don't just get born a camera operator. You're like, I know everything. You'll make mistakes and you learn and you learn from people. And it's an amazing scheme. It's a testament that it's gone for this long and it's still going. Um, they've, they're bringing people who might not necessarily even think about getting into this crazy industry, because it is competitive, you know, draining, long hours, very little pay when you're starting off. And it's given them a flavor of, of of a of a successful of a successfully run show and 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 program, you know, and hopefully telling them that it's it's going to be okay. It's giving them a helping hand, you know. And for me, when I when I when I acted in, in it, I you know I'd already done a bit. So, but it was it was amazing seeing a boom operator being you know a seventeen eighteen year old girl, and that's for me. I was like, I've never seen a boom operator, you know. Like it was amazing, and um, you know, your camera loader, clapperboard people being really young and asking questions it's an educational platform first and foremost but also it's giving them that first step and i think that's genius mm -hmm. and i mean had it's my shout been around well had i not been an actor and it's my shout had been around a couple of years earlier before i went to drama school i'd have definitely gone and applied for many of the roles you know so i'm just grateful now that i can be a director and help the rest of the crew on it you know mm. And uh, just finally, uh, Alex, uh, if you had to say to somebody who was considering uh, going into It's My Shout, kind of what, what would you say to them? Do it! <laughs> um, yeah, do it, be brave. Stick your neck out. This industry is competitive as it is. And if you really have a passion for any aspect of it, whether that's makeup, uh, art department, camera, uh, post-production, sound, there's so many options for you that even if you, you turn up on one day and you want to be a, you think sound is for me and, you, and it turns out that sound isn't for you, there are so many more roles that they can fit you into. And mm -hmm. this industry always needs new blood. It always does. There's more productions, more TV companies being set up. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's a really giving industry when, when you find your skill in it. And I think it's my chance, um, genius at doing that. And um, so yeah, if you have any trepidation, um, sign up. Also, you get to work with me maybe, potentially. So, I mean, you, they should sign up anyway, just when hearing I mean, about they that. just sign up just for the chance of that, Sam. It should just <laughs> be called uh, Alexander Vlahos, not It's My Shout. <laughs> um, Alex. Oh, talk to Roger about changing the name oh, of God, it. Get on it. Um, Alex, um, I think yeah. we've both been sat indoors for far too long now. It's yeah. um, so from me, Dioffin Bow. No worries. Thank you very much.